Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss the wreckage of neoliberalism, state terrorism, and resistance with the rapper Loki. What I try to do through my music is two main things. Assert collective agency, number one, in, and that is the confronting of um, the culture of power with the power of culture. And then the second issue is about um, uh, affirming a commitment and a loyalty to the dead and an opposition to the injustice which took their lives. In a way, it's an attempt to make audible the anguish of a mother singing to an empty bed and expose the pious hypocrisies that emptied that bed of her loved one. And I think that looking at that way that one can harness music as a tool in that process, it gives people strength because they understand the realities that they're facing. Great Britain is beset by the same kind of polarization and mounting racism as the United States. Brexit, like Trump's promise of a wall, is a weapon aimed at immigrants and people of color, used to mainstream Islamophobia, xenophobia, and racism. A staggering 71% of people from black and minority communities in Great Britain say they have faced racial discrimination. Great Britain, which like the United States, suffers from deindustrialization, draconian austerity, measures that have seen social and public services cut or diminished, and high unemployment and underemployment, has been on a downward spiral since the Iraq War and the so-called War on Terror. Civil liberties have been eroded. Politics has become as hate-filled and toxic as it has in the United States. Joining me in the studio in London to look at the wreckage of neoliberalism, state terrorism, and austerity that has infected Great Britain is one of Great Britain's most talented and courageous artists, the rapper Loki. He has built a following in the millions, despite often having his searing, truthful, and immensely moving work banned from the airwaves. We will end the show with one of his many masterpieces, Terrorist. So what you do, I think like a great artist, is through your music express the trauma that a disenfranchised population has experienced and turns it into, uh, in this case, a piece of music that empowers them. How, how, explain that process, how it works. Well, firstly, I wanted to say thank you so much for having me, Chris. Your work has really been inspiring to me and offered solace, really, in oh, difficult you. moments. Um, in terms of how one comes to use their trauma for um, conversion, really, into a collective energy, I kind of take a lot of uh, inspiration from the words of James Baldwin when he actually said that your pain is trivial except in so much as you're able to use it to connect to the pain of others. And it is through that that you can release yourself from that pain. Mm -hmm. Essentially what I try to do through my music is two main things. Assert collective agency, number one, in, and that is the confronting of um, the culture of power with the power of culture. And then the second issue is about um, uh, affirming a commitment and a loyalty to the dead and an opposition to the injustice which took their lives. In a way, it's an attempt to make audible the anguish of a mother singing to an empty bed and expose the pious hypocrisies that emptied that bed of her loved one. And I think that looking at that way that one can harness music as a tool in that process, it gives people strength because they understand the realities that they're facing when you look at, uh, for instance, the Schedule 7 Terrorism Act. The fact is that 80 percent of the people that have been stopped under this draconian measure. And you've been stopped under this. I have. Um, is 80 percent of the people are of minoritized communities who are just 13 percent of this population. When you look at uh, prevent measures which have stopped children racialized as Muslim uh, as young as three uh, um, and, and children under the age of nine have been taken out of classes and questioned by police without the presence of their parents about their feelings 
um, uh, regarding the Middle East. When you compare that to the fact that, according to someone like Chris Hunter, terrorism expert who advised the British government on their uh, security um, issues, your chances of being caught in a terrorist attack in this country are one in 16 million. According to um, Europol, between 2006 and 2013, the percentage of terrorist attacks which were carried out by um, Muslims was 0.7. So in comparison to the actual threat to human life and the way that it is dealt with by the state, you know, you're looking at a budget of 816 uh, million pounds annually that counterterrorism gets in this country. And of course, it disproportionately targets um, people, you know, according to Mark Sagerman, who's former employee of the CIA that worked on terrorism. Um, less than one in every million Muslims has anything to do with political violence. We know that 70% of the terroriz terrorism convictions in this country have been for non-violent uh, stuff, whether it's having material which is deemed to be outside of the norm or the well, acceptable norm. you have a, a song so, on the Grenville, Grenville uh, explain yeah. what happened, but uh, you point out quite correctly, mm. these are the real terrorists. Yeah. Well, I mean, the I thing guess explain for the American audience what happened. This was a fire in a public house. But just yeah. explain and then explain why you quite correctly name the yeah. people who put the company, yeah. that put people's lives, yeah. extinguishes human yeah. life. Yeah. Well, essentially, um, on June 14th, 2017, um, a building called Grenfell Tower. It's believed to have been named after a British colonial officer, Francis Wallace Grenfell. It contained uh, uh, public housing. Uh, there were uh, over 10 leaseholders in there, people that owned their properties. Um, but the area in general was under threat of uh, gentrification and being demolished. The refurbishment of Grenfell Tower was part of that project. Um, and in fact, people in the wider area and, you know, the people that died in there were my neighbours, we considered Grenfell to be uh, the only safe building from demolition because it had been refurbished in the way that it had. But that refurbishment was actually the nail in its coffin. It was fitted with um, arconic P.E. Rennebond cladding, which contained six millimetres of polyethylene in the centre of it, in between, sandwiched in between aluminium plates. Um, it also contained uh, Celotex RS5000 insulation, which both of these, it is now clear, were very, very flammable and very, very dangerous to human lives. So at the point when uh, the fire began to spread at a really um, unusual speed, Unfortunately, the fire brigade kept to the stay put policy um, far longer than they should have. Of course, it's important to know that the fire brigade has been uh, the victim of really serious um, austerity, over 100 million pounds cut, 1,000 jobs cut, um, but they were not um, in any way ready to deal with it. We're talking now about over 400 buildings across the country that are believed to have this same uh, ACM uh, arconic cladding on it. Um, from hospitals to schools to cinemas. And, and, and that fire um, uh, in 2017 led to the deaths of uh, 72 people um, inhaling cyanide uh, and whatnot. But unfortunately, rather than the conversation in the corporate media being about um, whether uh, companies like Arconic, US construction company, or Celotex, a French construction company, have the right to fit dangerous materials on buildings, um, it's about whether Muslims have the right to live yeah. in social housing in North Kensington. Let's not forget that it's now looking like 200,000 people across the country are exposed to the same materials. Um, the walls are now potentially um, uh, a weapon. Well, not a weapon. You'd say the walls are now potentially uh, serious, uh, seriously detrimental to human life. And that song, like most of your work, was uh, not only a validation of uh, the voices of you know those that have been uh, pushed aside. Chomsky calls them the unpeople. It's not that they don't have a voice, it's that they're denied a voice. Uh, there's a play by August Wilson, Joe Turner, Come and Gone. I don't know if you know it, but he uh, is dealing with it. It's set in 1910, a great African-American playwright. And he's talking about how uh, the people fleeing north from the trauma of uh, lynching and uh, the aftermath of slavery and uh, he, he talks, actually uses, he says, you know, you have, there's a conjurer in the play and he keeps telling them that they have to find their song. 
that they will only mm. be whole when they find their song. And I want to explore that idea with you uh, as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, that, and because I see that as what you're doing, is essentially you are, you are holding up their song. And, and why, and even such as your Grenville uh, Tower uh, song, th there's, there's a recognition of the marginalization, the demonization, the racism, and the pain, and yet it, 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 it grounded in that reality, I think it offers a kind of hope. Why? Mm. Well, I would say one thing that James Baldwin said about the role of the artist was that the role is to elevate the moment that a child is born above all other moments mm, mm. and that to to uh, implore the uh, the society to see that moment as more sacred than any other moment and so within all of these processes when they play out there is a logic which underlies it and that is the glorification of profit and the degradation of human life now if you invert that logic and glorify human life. And also mm. not just that, historicize the victories that are won. Because the way that this violence functions is attritional. And along the way, there are also attritional victories. And so if you can find a way to, to couch what you're doing in the existing social movements of the time. You know, for me, there's always been a tension between whether the work that I'm doing exists uh, outside of the material conditions and the struggles which are playing out. It's important to bond the music to it and allow the music to be a component of the wider social movement. And so for me that was a really important uh, thing with that track and to really give people, um, empower their resistance. How do you prevent it from becoming agitprop? Well again I think you know one uh, really powerful uh, thing that Eduardo Galeano said was that uh, a tombstone is actually vertical whereas the grave is horizontal looking up at the sky the tombstone is looking out at the rest of the world and speaking for the dead to a certain extent now in the neighborhood following the Grenfell fire we have been caught in what uh, some refer to as a case of hauntology so it is uh, a nostalgia for futures lost, mm. um, a constant state of anticipation for more just futures, much like the Palestinians after 1948, much like many Iraqis after 2003. There is a point at which we cannot move forward from that date. Now, while I think there is an importance to have a coherence to your political message that sometimes being part of a wider political movement can give you, you do sometimes run the risk, like someone like Najil Ali, who was assassinated here in London, yeah. of course, when that overarching political project may deviate in some way and your artistic freedom may brush up against the limits of that political movement. It is important to have that freedom in what you're doing to not be completely chiseled to the leadership of a political movement. But at the same time, I do think it's important to be aware that it is serving a, a wider and more important case. But I would say the way in which it, it, it differentiates itself from agitprop or propaganda in that way is that it's about the sanctity of human yeah. life. It's, it's not about the elevation of political figures, it's about the sanctity of important human life. Point. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about art and resistance with rapper Loki. Welcome back to On Contact. We continue our conversation about art and resistance with the rapper Loki. Um, Emma Goldman said that great art makes ideas, or let's extend it, injustices felt. That's why totalitarian regimes are so frightened of authentic artists such as yourself. Um, the uh, song that we're going to end the show with was virtually blacklisted, I think. Was that, I mean, it really didn't get any play on any commercial or That's mainstream. Right. Mm -hmm. You yourself 
uh, have been targeted. Uh, I believe you attempted to go on tour in the United States. I'll let you explain what happened. Well, my visa was refused uh, in the United States, and that's not particularly surprising to me when I think of the myriad of ways that um, people that are racialized in Mus as Muslims during the war and terror period are demobilized by not just um, the forces of the deep state, but also the mainstream media. There's a symbiotic relationship between them, whether it's the passing of legislation, whether it's the curtailing of freedom of speech um, in institutions, whether it's having uh, your talks cancelled in different places. Merely thinking critically about British foreign policy at this time enters you into what they call pre-criminal space. And so you are bringing yourself under the gaze of the deep surveillance uh, state. So I'm not surprised that, you know, the United States under Trump uh, would not allow me to have a visa to come and perform and, and talk about the things I speak about in my music. And what about the way, I mean, you've been very uh, vocal about uh, Israeli war crimes and what's happened to the Palestinian people. How within Great Britain have they uh, attempted to marginalize you as an artist? Well, I think it's about policing language. So what it uh, says is it's defining the terms at which you can discuss um, the oppression of the Palestinian people. So you can talk about Benjamin Netanyahu, and you can even talk about the Israeli government. But you can't question the underlying logic of Zionism. You can't problematize that. And I think that it is that exact job that an artist should serve, is to... Is to destabilize those pious hypocrisies. And so when we look at the way in which Britain as a state is directly involved in the siege of Gaza through the uh, uh, drones that Israel use, um, through the selling of components for sniper rifles, which are now being used to target civilians in violation of the Fort Geneva Conventions, you know, this is something that you as an artist, are put into a position where you make a clear choice. If I talk about this kind of anti-racism, which is anti-racism which supports the Palestinians' right to return, for example, UN Resolution 194, it is their right, supposedly, under international law to return. If you draw those connections, then you will find yourself ghettoized outside the earshot of the masses. And so that has really been a, a process that has played out for me across my career, definitely. Well, nevertheless, you've built a kind of following, quite a quite a large following, but it, you know, to a certain extent, it's uh, uh, underground. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit as we before we go in about this amazing song you did, yeah, uh, terrorism, mm -hmm. which we're going to play. Uh, I have the lyrics. You're a great poet. Um, Thank you. But just talk a little bit about that song, which. You, well, so if we compare the chances of dying due to terrorism to, say, for example, across the last nine years, 130,000 people have died uh, for preventable uh, reasons due to austerity. By the way, at the same time, the wealth of the 1,000 richest people in this country, the combined wealth, has increased by uh, 500 uh, billion. Half of the land in this country is owned by 1% of this country. If you compare your likelihood in dying from terrorism to your likelihood in dying from austerity, it's clear that you're far more likely statistically right. to die from austerity than to die from terrorism. Uh, the, the Muslim has provided a cash cow for the arms companies. And we can even see it with Frank Gaffney, you know, the author of Trump's Muslim ban, really, or credited right. with being responsible for it, being funded by Boeing, Raytheon, uh, Lockheed Martin. There is a real marriage of interests. We look at an organization like Middle East Forum that funded uh, Tommy Robinson here. They are funded by Donor Capital Fund, which takes its money from the Koch brothers. So there is a real marriage of interests when we think about uh, the arms companies, the fossil fuel industry, and this uh, uh, propagation of a mythology of the perennial enemy, which is the Muslim. Well, you also, I mean, if we, I, mean, I spent seven years in the Middle East, uh, and I speak as an American, uh, the American military and the British have decapitated far more people, including children, than ISIS has ever decapitated. That's right. And that is in this piece that you write, this is what you lift up, this yeah. reality um, of all of these people who have been murdered. Yeah. Um, but 
at the same time have been demonized. Yeah, I mean, Mahmoud Darwish in uh, one of his greatest poems, Fakir Bighayrak, Think of Others, he says, When you liberate yourself with metaphors, think of others, those that lost their right to speak. Yeah, and, and that really compels me to make this music. And that's what we're going to do it now. And uh, yeah, stunning work. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chris. Work.